So uh, I got the um, exams graded, so you should be able to see those up on, on Canvas now. And then they are factored in, kind of weighted for everyone 30%. So it kind of treats it as though it's gonna be your best exam. So if it wasn't, you know, it's gonna kind of give you a, a worst case scenario kind of outlook. Um, if you have any questions over anything, the grading, please reach out and, and do that as, you know, ASAP. Um, don't do it three weeks from now. So, uh, you know, that all, all you know, your, your scores kind of should all be up to date. Um, my GAs are helping me kind of grade your sections, uh, second Excel assignments. So once those are done, uh, you'll kind of have a pretty good idea about where you're standing at, is at in the class. Right? I also have that Learn Smart poster, which I said needs to be done before we meet on Monday. Okay. And uh, that should cover it. Any questions for me before we kind of jump into some of this new material? All right, so let's go up here. Okay. So we'll start today off kind of talking about this guy, Carl Gauss. Uh, I don't mean none of this stuff really matters, but he was you know, really smart, had his hands in a lot of different things. Uh, then him, along with another mathematician, Mouvray, uh, discovered the normal distribution, which is sometimes referred to as the Gaussian distribution, kind of using his last name there. So this normal distribution, right, he ends up, you know, later on in life discovering it. Um, but one of the early anecdotes about his life is that he was a kid, he was acting up, um, and the teacher had this idea of, like, told him to go over, stand in the corner, count from one to 100, right? like add all, the, all those values up. So one plus two is three, plus three is six, plus four is 10. Do that all the way up to the, you know, 100. So uh, this is gonna keep him preoccupied and, and you know, hopefully it calms down. He comes back in a matter of seconds and he has the correct answer. You know, how did he do this? So this kind of just highlights the way that some people's brains work. Mine definitely wouldn't have jumped to this right away. Uh, but if you think about, we have all these numbers we're trying to add up. What is 100 plus 1? 101. What's 2 plus 99? 101. 3 plus 98? 101. And this continues all the way down until 50 and 51, which is 101. So we'd have 50 pairs that add up to 101. 50 times 101 is 5,050. Right? So this kind of highlights that even at a young age, this guy was kind of brilliant. So you know, there is a formula you can actually use to add up 1 to any number you wish. Right. So 1 to 250, you would just plug 250 in here and you could come up with what, what that would add up to. And he was able to kind of envision this, right, in grade school without ever seeing some kind of, a, you know, any kind of a formula like this. So, you know, why is it important that we have this normal distribution, right? It's a unique type of continuous random variable, but it pops up for a lot of different things we're going to do. So we'll be talking about the normal distribution and using it really for the rest of the semester. Right? So I'm going to try to make sure we get a really good base understanding of it. Um, but we, you know, how did they discover it, right? How did Gauss discover it? Well, it pops up in nature a lot. So we have things like human height, rainfall, temperature, uh, really human weight. If we look at a lot of different human performance measures, which we'll I'll kind of show you a couple at the end of class today, we see they all kind of follow this normal distribution. It pops up all the time. So, you know, Mouvre and, and Gauss, right, they write this book and kind of explains all this where they see, you know, all these different things they've recorded, different animals kind of sizes, and they all follow a normal distribution. Right? And then eventually we'll end up applying this to something very important called regression at the end of the semester, right? So that's actually where we end is with regression. So this normal distribution follow us, follows us all the way up to that point. So just like the uniform distribution or any distribution we can think about, there's going to be some probability density function. Now, the probability density function for a normal distribution looks pretty nasty, right? This is not a, not a nice looking formula. And, and we're not going to have to really do a whole lot of this. So don't, don't worry about like jotting this down, right? Because someone's already done a lot of the work that we would have to do with this formula, right? And hopefully, I think we'll get there by the end of today. So if we look at this function, then we'll notice that there's two things that are kind of defining it, right? Or that would change this density function, the mean, and then sigma squared, which is the variance. So those two things are gonna define the normal distribution and that we could have two different variables. So maybe like rainfall and human height, they're both normally distributed, but right, they'd have very different means. Hell, their means aren't even, you know, potentially in the same units, 
So those are the two things that will kind of define the normal distribution. And then notice, you know, I said it pops up a lot in nature. We also have these numbers that pop up a lot in nature that end up both being part of this normal distribution function, which is pi and this natural kind of number E, right? That 2.71828. So you know, we've got this probability density function. Right? We could think about if I could then plot that, right? Plug in different values of X and have, allow that probability density function to plot out those Y values, I could get this normal distribution or sometimes called the bell curve or the Gaussian distribution. And one of the characteristics is, is gonna be that it's symmetric, right? So its mean is exactly equal to, I think I have that here, it's, it's median. So that tells us that if we look at the mean, there's gonna be 50% of the observations to, to the right, 50% to the left. If the area under this curve is one, which I think I have, oh, I, sorry, it's, it's, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. But if the area under the curve is one, then if I think about the mean, what's the probability of being above or below the mean? Both 0.5. So I already mentioned that this normal distribution is going to be defined by its mean and defined by its variance. The first thing we can think about is maybe I was going to go record human height and I do it in three different countries, right? So maybe I go collect it in, in the United States and I, I draw out the distribution of all these heights I've collected in the United States. It looks normally distributed and it has a mean, we'll call it here mu2. Right? I then go to Mexico, I look at their average height, that I, I will plot that distribution. And I find that they have an average height that's a little bit below the United States. Well, then maybe I go to like, uh, oh, what's the one that I, I've seen this data before? I think, um, not Sweden. I, yeah, uh, Norway, right? I go to Norway, I collect heights there, I plot that, I end up seeing that they have an average that's higher than kind of the United States and Mexico, right? So if we look around different countries, they may all have nor the height may all follow a normal distribution in each country, but some countries have a higher, higher average, right? So it shifts my distribution to the left and the right. Okay. Any questions on, on that? So that's the, the first thing. The, the mean will just shift our distribution. The second thing is the variance, right? So I have a picture, but I want to kind of draw this out. So let's go to the dot cam here. Let's switch over. Try to highlight this. All right, so let's say I've got this nice normal distribution, right? It's got some mean. And let's say it has a variance of 10. If I then want to look at a distribution that has a higher variance, so let's say, and actually we'll call this group one, it could be group two. Let's say it has a variance that's higher. Right? A higher variance is telling us that the data is more dispersed, that these outcomes for X, it's more likely we see values further away from the mean, right? A higher variance is capturing that there's more values that are further from the mean. So we think about as having the probability up here on our Y axis, a higher variance means that these values far from the mean, right? these values, are a lot more likely than they were before, right? So they have a higher probability of occurring. It also means that when we look at values near the mean with a higher variance, it's less likely we see those values that are really close to the mean, right? So all these values close to the mean become less likely, all the values further from the mean become more likely when we have this higher variance. And so this higher variance essentially kind of flattens out our curve. I kind of drew it to an extreme here. Um, we'll go back to the slides, I'll have another picture, but the higher the variance, the kind of the flatter the curve I get. So the mean shifts it around and the variance kind of flattens it or peaks it, right? The lower the standard deviation means the values near the mean are more likely, right? So I could actually, you know, let's think about something that had like a, a variance of one. It might look something like this, right? where the values near the mean are really, really, really likely, values further from the mean, kind of less likely. Okay. Questions on that before we keep moving? Okay. 
that's in the chat. All right. So I have another kind of visual representation here of that, just kind of highlighting that as we get a higher variance, this distribution gets flatter. So let's say I were to compare these two distributions of male and female height, right? So when looking at these distributions, what are two statements I can make? One about the mean and one about the variance. So what, what could I say about the mean between of male height and the mean of female height? Oh, screen and switch over. Thank you. There we go. Oh. Maybe. There we go. So what can I say about the mean male height and the mean female height here? Yeah, right. If I look at the mean, it's kind of where that, remember, the mean splits the state in half. So it's where the, the distribution would be symmetric. So kind of male mean height would be around 70, 71 inches, female 64, 65 inches, right? So just by finding kind of that peak point of my normal distribution, that tells me where the mean is at. Which of these have a higher variance? Yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of counterintuitive, right? The lower the curve, the flatter the curve, the higher the variance, right? Because that's telling me the data is more dispersed. So we see higher variance in male height uh, than in female height here. Well, you know, one thing to point out once we start being able to look at these different normal distributions, you know, just because we have female height here being lower than male height, every single point here represents people who are males who are shorter than the females on this part of the female distribution, right? So there's a lot of kind of overlap in these distributions, but we generally talk about, you know, make the generalizations and using the means. Okay. So the area under this curve we said was one. But I also know that if I go one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below the mean, there will always be 68% or sorry, the probability I see an outcome in that range will always be 68%. Right? Now, how do I know this? We'll kind of get, get at this idea at the end of class. Um, and if I forget to kind of reference this again, uh, remind me, but we'll do something that we can kind of come back to these slides and say, well, this is why I know it's always 68%. And if I go two standard deviations above and below the mean, the probability I see the X value be in this range is about 95% or point, probability of 0.95. Three standard deviations above and below the mean, I'm all the way up to 0.997, almost a probability of one at that point, right? The probability I see something that's between three standard deviations above and below the mean, very, very, almost a, almost a guarantee that I see, you know, the X, the uh, random variable X take on an outcome that's somewhere in this range. So we're going to hopefully build up to being able to figure out how I'm getting these probabilities, right? Why do I know this is true by the end of the class? So remember, we said the normal distribution is defined by its mean and its variance. So the way that we'll typically write this is we have some random variable X and we know it's normally distributed. So it's distributed normally. Last class we said we had a U here that was distributed uniformly with this mean and this variance. Well, that's great. But you know, every time I'd wanna find, well, what's the probability I see, you know, human height between 60 and 70 inches? Well, I mean, I gotta integrate that function, do all this work. Well, there's a way we can sidestep that, which is I can convert this normally distributed variable X into what we'll call a standard normally distributed variable, which is that this new variable X would have a mean of zero and a variance of one. Okay. So a standard normal distribution is still a normal distribution. It's just that it's a special case where the mean is zero and the variance is one. So this will do some, some nice things for us. We think about, if I've got mean zero variance of one, we're gonna start calling these Z scores, right? So I think originally this slide had this as this variable X has a standard normal distribution. Well, there's a way we can convert any normally distributed variable X into a standard normal distribution. Anytime we see a standard normal distribution, we start to refer to the values as Z values instead of kind of X values, right? And the reason why is if we think about it, if I were to go, let's say I have this variable Z and it has a mean of zero and a, and a variance of one, what's the standard deviation of that distribution? 
So it's just the square root of the variance. Variance is one, the square root of one is one. So I have a standard deviation of one. So anytime I say, see a Z value, let's say the Z value is 2.3. Actually, I'll do an easy one first. Let's just say it's two. If the mean is zero, how many standard deviations away from the mean would that Z value of two be? Well, if the standard deviation is one, the number two would be two standard deviations away from that mean of zero. And if I, or I can think about negative two, I'm two standard deviations below that mean of zero. Z value of one, I'm one standard deviation above the mean, right? And so basically this, these Z score, or sorry, these Z values will have the interpretation of, this is the number of standard deviations away from the mean that you are, okay? Well, knowing this interpretation of these Z values, can we convert any normal distribution into a standard normal? And the answer is yes, right? So here's our equation for calculating what we'll call Z scores. We're gonna take the original variable X that's normally distributed. So maybe this is um, human height, right? I plug in the value of 70 and say, how many standard deviations is being 70 inches tall away from the mean, right? How many standard deviations away from the mean is that 70 inches? Well, I subtract the mean height divided by the standard deviation and that will give me a Z value. So maybe it's like 1.3. So that would tell me that that height of 70 inches would be 1.3 standard deviations above the mean. So it converts my values for that original variable X into these nice, easy, interpretable kind of Z scores. Okay. Um, so that Z score will always represent the number of standard deviations away from the mean. So you can think about if I looked at the mean, its Z score would be zero because if I plug the mean value in for X, the mean minus the mean is zero, right? So that mean should always have a Z score of zero. And then it tells us how many standard deviations away we are, you know, with, with the number that it is. And then if it's positive, that means we have a certain number of standard deviations above the mean. And if it's negative, that'd be a certain number of standard deviations below the mean. And I think I can highlight to you that to you in just a second. But the real important thing we know is that through creating these z-scores, we know those z-scores are gonna be standard normally distributed, okay? So why do I know that's gonna be true? Oh, wait, actually, I wanna to go to Excel, okay? I'm just gonna do this in Excel because I think it's a little bit easier. Um, I could write this out by hand, but we can kind of do the, the calculations pretty quick and still get at the same idea. So let's say I have this little data set. It's five values, right? Like I said, you could write this down. You don't have to necessarily write this down in Excel. Um, I'm gonna think about, I, I can turn each one of these X values into a Z-score, okay? So just to highlight some. So what do I need? I need the mean of X and I need the standard deviation of x, right? So I can use that average function in Excel to find the mean of these five, five numbers. I'll use uh, the standard deviation, and we'll treat this as population data just to now. So I do that standard deviation, hit enter. So to create my z-scores, I said, all right, I'm gonna take that x value, I'm gonna subtract the mean, and then I'm going to divide by the standard deviation, right? This should give me the z-score. Okay. So I hit enter, sure enough, I get a z-score. So what this is telling me is that the value of 10, right? It was four units, whatever units this variable is, if it was height, you know, four inches, but four units away from the mean. How many standard deviations away was that? So that is what my z-score tells me. So being four away from the mean here, was being 1.4 standard deviations above that mean. Okay. Now, if I wanna create this z-score for every value, I always wanna subtract the mean and divide by this same standard deviation. So I need to put some dollar signs around those cell references so that I freeze them. Now, when I copy this down, now I've got the z-scores for each, and I could do these all by hand, but I made it a little bit easier to do this in Excel. So notice, when I looked at an X value that was four above the mean, that translated to 1.4 standard deviations above the mean. 
And here, if I look at this x value of two, it was four below the mean. So it should have that same z score, but negative. Now let's see if what I told you was actually true. I can find the mean and the standard deviation of z. So if I look at the average or the mean of these z scores, unless I lied to you, it should be that that mean is zero. And it should be that if I do the standard deviation, I should get one. And that'll always be the case. If I subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation, this will always be true. Now, one thing to point out is when I had the original variable was normally distributed and symmetric, right? There was, I kind of look at each side of the mean here. It's identical in the sense that it's just move. It's just one is above and one is below, but it's the same numbers above and below. So my Z scores ended up also being symmetrical, right? Let's say I started out with a distribution that wasn't symmetrical, right? So we have this one observation that's got a real long right tail. So notice my Z scores are no longer symmetric either, but when it comes to finding the mean and the standard deviation of my Z scores, by turning them into Z scores, I always know I'll be getting a mean and a standard deviation of zero, right? So I don't have a standard normal distribution here because I didn't start out with a normally distributed variable, right? It was skewed. But if I had a normal distributed variable, my Z scores are now standard normally distributed. But either way, both these data sets, I can standardize them by creating Z scores, right? By standardizing them, I give them a mean of zero and a variance of one and a standard deviation of one as well. So I always think rather than going through the mathematical proof, like seeing this play out with numbers is always like a little bit more reaffirming to me. Um, but are there any questions on, on this before we kind of keep moving? You good? Okay. Uh, what was the next thing I want to do? Oh, yeah. So I stole this from a book because I like the overlay. Um, but because I'll start doing this a lot when we work, work through some examples. So if we have this random variable X and we start to think about, we can see different values for X that would be maybe three standard deviations below the mean, one standard deviation above the mean. We can always map those out onto Z scores because that's the interpretation of our Z score, right? So being one standard deviation above the mean, that should turn into a Z score of one. Being three standard deviations above the mean should turn into a Z score of Three, right? We can map down all these values to Z scores. So why does it work out that way? Well, if we think about what we're doing with a Z score, we've got take the X value you're interested in, subtract the mean, and divide by the standard deviation. Well, let's say that X value we're interested in is two standard deviations below the mean. So whatever that value is, if we plugged it in up here, We'll get something like this. And notice the mean minus the mean will cancel. These cancel and we'd be left with a z-score of negative two. So anytime we see an x value, if it's two standard deviations below the mean, it'll always turn into a z-score of two. That's why we said that's the interpretation of our z-scores. Oops. Um, the other thing to point out here is, I forgot my market cap, give me a second, is, um, we won't like see this, right? We're gonna see a value for X, but inherently it is some standard deviations above or below the mean. And so that's why when we plug it in, it will always work out to giving us that nice, easy interpretable Z score. I can't hold on to this market cap. All right, so that's how we can kind of map those different, different values. So what use are these z-scores gonna to be to us? Well, we talked last class about this cumulative density function, right? So if I plug A into this cumulative density function, it would give me the probability I see A or anything less. And if I plugged B in, it gave me the probability I saw B or anything below it. We then talked about how we could use those cumulative density functions, take the smaller area, subtract it from the larger area, and we'd be left with what's in between. Now, what's the cumulative density function for this normal distribution? It's a mess, right? We already looked at the probability density function. That was a mess. So we're not, we don't, you know, I don't want to have to integrate that function every time. 
to find out what the probability on below a certain value is. But if we can convert our, normal dist our normally distributed variable into a standard normally distributed, distributed variable, other people have already done the work for us, right? So there's a standard normal table, which I'll show you in a second, and I, I already actually have it up on Canvas, that's gonna essentially be a cumulative density function. I'll look up a certain Z value and it will tell me the probability I see that Z value or anything below it. Okay. So let's take a look. Well, let's assume maybe I have that the, the height example. So like, uh, right, maybe I'm thinking about 70 inches tall. How many standard deviations? Well, actually, that wouldn't make any sense. I need something like, uh, I think for the one we're going to look at, 60 inches tall, right? How many standard deviations below the mean is that? Well, we convert it into a z-score and we find it's negative 1.29 standard deviations, right? So what's the probability that if I show someone at random that they're 60 inches or shorter, right? Or 1.29 standard deviations below the mean or even further from the mean. So we're thinking about there, are my 1.29 standard deviations below the mean or any value even further below? So instead of integrating this, there's a cumulative density function, which essentially the values are portrayed to us in this standard normal table. So the table looks something like this. This slide has like kind of some step-by-step -step things if you're going back and looking at it. But because it's a little bit easier to see, I have the file pull open, which is just, it's called Z tables on uh, Canvas. So if you just go to files, should just be, oh yeah, there it is, sitting right there. Okay. So we've got this standard normal table, if I had that Z value of negative 1.29, how would I find the area to the left of it? Or the probability I see that Z score or something even more extreme, like right? something below it. Okay. So I'm going to go down here. I've got negative 1.2. So the first thing I do is I look up the first decimal point. So negative 1.29, negative 1.2. I then use my column headings to look up the second decimal. So negative 1.29, the second decimal is this 0.09, right? So 0 0.09, negative 1.2. The probability I see that z-score of negative 1.29 or anything below it is 0.0985, okay? So if I'm thinking about this visually, what I just did was I looked up this Z value of negative 1.29. I found the probability that I'm 1.29 standard deviations below the mean or anything further below the mean is 0 0.0985. Now, where did this kind of originally come from? Well, these were Z values. And I, you know, I said to assume this, but it came from this idea of thinking about what's the probability that if I chose someone at random, they're 60 inches tall or anything less. Well, when I converted that into a Z score, right, going from an X value to a Z score, that was negative 1.29. But I know that the area to the left of negative 1.29 will be the same as that area to the left of, of 60, right? Once I've converted that into a Z score. So it's kind of what we're doing there, um, kind of bigger picture. Um, what if I wanted to look up positive 1.29? Well, actually, we'll stay here for a second. Um, I want to point something out. So if I think about a z-score of zero, that should be my mean, right, for a standard normal distribution. What's the probability that I see something above the mean? What's the probability I see something below the mean? Yeah, both should be 0.5. So right away, when I start to think about this, anytime I see a negative z-score, the area to the left of it will always be less than 0.5, right? As soon as I start to move to negative z-scores, the area starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Anytime I see a positive z-score, the area to the left of that has to be greater than 0.5, right? So that'd be one like kind of little trick we can, we can you know, use is that the area to the left and the right of the mean is going to be 0 0.5 there. And because we know the mean is zero, negative z scores, the error will be less than 0.5 to the left. Positive z scores, the error will be greater than 0.5. Sure enough, look at all my negative z scores here. They're all 
you know, these are the probability of seeing that Z score anything to the left or the area to the left of these Z scores. They're all below 0.5. Once I get to the positive z scores, now the area to the left of the z scores all start to be above 0.5. And in fact, that z score of 0, 0.00, exactly 0.5 to the left of it. Okay. Any questions on, on kind of how I'm using this table and kind of going through a little bit quickly? But I basically just use the column and the row headings to identify my z score out to the second decimal. And you can imagine like, I'm going to have to start rounding some of my Z scores because I can only go to the second decimal. If I wanted to go to the third decimal, I need almost like this like three dimensional table that where I could like go out in the other dimension and find the third decimal. But for the sake of what we're doing, this gives us a really close approximation in most, most cases. Okay. Um, so yeah, so these slides are just kind of what I, kind of me walking through those examples. Now what if I had looked up positive 1.29? Okay, so, oops. Going there. I just want to go to this. So I want to look up positive 1.2, go over to the second decimal, 9. So 1.29, the area to the left of that is 0 0.9015. So I'll kind of redraw this here. But if I think about what I'm doing with these z-scores, I just found that the area to the left of positive 1.29 0.90, I don't know, I think this is, uh, I think it was 1.5. Okay. And earlier we had found that the area to the left of negative 1.29, right, this was 0 0.0985. Okay. Well, now notice, if the area to the left of positive 1.29 is 0 0.9015, what's the area to the right? of positive 1.29. So the area to the left is 0 0.9015. The area under the curve is one, yeah. One minus that ends up being the exact same thing we found over here, but why? Well, remember, this is a symmetric distribution around zero, so I should be able to like fold this on top of itself so the area to the right of positive 1.29 should be the same as the area to the left. Now, if I hadn't done this work already, you know, I had to look up the z-score on the table. The table tells me the area to the left, but if I want the area to the right, it's simply one minus that area to the left, right? Essentially using that complement rule, really. Um, okay. Any questions on that before we keep moving here? All right. So we've kind of already went through a lot of these actually the next, you know, I already just talked about this, right? We'll see a lot of these numbers pop up, um, like pretty common um, in most classes, like the Z scores of 1.29, 1.65, 1.96. 1 they all translate into these kind of nice benchmark probabilities, right? About 90%, about 95%, about 97.5, so on and so forth. So we'll see these pop up quite a bit and we'll start getting real familiar with some of these, these values. I already mentioned kind of how we can use is that complement rule to find the probability of being greater than a certain value. We already talked about the mean since it's symmetric, there's 0.5 on either side. This is kind of just things I've already kind of talked us through. You can see that, you know, it's probably a good idea for you to print out or make sure you can have this file pulled up as we're going through class. I'll try to zoom in and make it as, you know, always pull it up and make it as easy to see as possible, but it's probably easier to kind of have it in front of you to use by hand. You know, if I show on a slide, obviously it's going to be very, very small. So this is kind of highlighting that in order to be able to read this table, it might be a good idea to start bringing it with you if you're showing up in class or kind of having it in front of you if you're, you're watching via Zoom. Okay. And like I said, that's up on Canvas. So let's go through one more. So what's the probability that I see the z-score be greater than or equal to negative 2.5? So let's just, I think it's always helpful to first draw out what you're looking for. So if I want the probability of being a z-score that is negative 2.53 or greater. So right away, what do I know has to be true? That probability has to be, well, if the mean here is zero, 
the area to the right of the mean is 0.5. So I have that area plus more. So right away, I know that it probably has to be greater than 0.5. Now, I'm probably not real familiar with z-scores yet, but earlier I said something about like, the probability that we're three standard deviations above and below was like 0.99. So you can start to think even being three standard deviations away from the mean is pretty far. So being two and a half standard deviations below the mean is pretty far away from that zero. What would the z-score have to be in order for me to see a probability that was like barely above 0.5? It would have to be something that's barely below zero maybe like something like negative 0.1, right? So probably gonna guess this is a little bit closer to one than it is 0.5, right? Sure enough, if we look at the possible answers, I mean, negative values don't make sense for finding a probability. This value isn't greater than 0.5, and if I'm choosing between A and D, in order for the area to the right of the z-score to be 0 0.5057, I'd have to have a z-score that was really, really close to zero, something like negative 0.1, which is what I was kind of pointing out here. So probably gonna be something closer to one. So this is probably the safe bet, but we don't have to bet. Oh, I hit the wrong thing again. We don't have to bet. We can go to the table, right? So I look up, see if I can get this all in the same thing. There we go. Negative 2.5. Second decimal was three, so negative 2.53, 0 0.0057. But remember, the table's always telling me the area to the left. Was it 0 0.0057, I think? So if I wanted the area to the right, right, that was the original one I had shaded. The area to the right should just be one minus that or 0.9943. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. All right. And I think the next one I had, what's the probability that's less than negative 2.53? Well, that was the one we already looked up. We know that's going to be 0 0.0057. Right? So that made that a little bit easier. Okay, before I talk about these, I want to relate something to what we talked about earlier. Let's do, let's do the two standard deviation one. So I told you the probability that we're two standard deviations above and below, that area is 0.9544. So how can I reproduce this, right? Well, being two standard deviations above and below, really what I'm thinking about there is, what's the probability that my z-score is between two and negative two, right? So, looking at my distribution of z-scores, what's the probability it's between negative two and two, right? Well, I'll first look up that z-score of negative two and get this area over here to the left. Right? So I go to my table, I look up negative two, which would be negative 2.00, right? So the area to the left of that is 0 0.0228. Okay? So I have that this area here, 0 0.0228. I'll then look up the Z value of Two, which would kind of give me this area, All right? So I look up that z-score of two. Scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. So uh, 2.00, 0 0.9772. So this is 0.9772. Remember what I originally wanted was the probability that I'm in between those two. So kind of this blue shaded area so all I'll do is take the larger area, subtract out this tail, and I'd be left with just what's in between. So 0.9772 minus 0 0.0228 well, ends up being 0.95, how am I looking at this backwards? So 0.9544, I think, or 46. I'm doing this, this in my head right. 
you can double check my work there, but right, it's about 95%, right? And so that's why whenever I go two standard deviations above and below the mean, well, that will always be a z-score of two and negative two. When I look those values up in the table, I'll always find these same probabilities. I'm always gonna get about 95% of the data in between two standard deviations above and below the mean. All right, so that's where those values were coming from. Questions on that? Is that clear? Or, okay. So is that chart there? Yeah. Almost like a standard. Any uh, graph that we look at will follow that. So. Anytime we have converted our values into z scores, this will always be the values we would find. Yep. Yeah. Specifically, once we convert whatever variable we're looking at into a z score. This table? Oh yeah, you would, you would definitely want to have this print out or like be able to pull it up because I mean, this is, we're going to be using this a lot. Yeah. Yeah. As we go through the, I think we'll, you'll see that. Yeah. You'd have to, you have to have, have this, right? I mean, unless you can memorize these numbers, but, but you know, I, I could ask you any, I could ask you for a Z value of uh, 1.44. It's not a very, or actually that one looks kind of like it might be when we, here, here we go. Neg uh, 0.34. 0.63, you know, that's not a benchmark, you know, but I could ask you to, to find that. Um, okay, so that sets us up, I think, pretty good um, for the start thinking about how to use that table. So the one thing I did want to kind of bring up at the end of class here, uh, I had some data from this one survey where it had uh, 12,000 people on their height. So I grabbed all their height and I tried to kind of graph it out. So you can kind of see it, it's a little bit off, but it follows a pretty close to a normal distribution. When we look at human height, it tends to look like it's normally distributed and this kind of is a, a way of showing that. Uh, I also like, I followed this Instagram account and I don't remember, it had something to do with like uh, fitness and like they were posting some of the CrossFit game stuff or maybe this was like their open workouts, I think it was. Um, but notice like, they were geeking out about, I don't remember what it was about this, but I think like the top end. But when I saw this picture, I was like, this is absurd, especially for how close the, the women performance was. I mean, this is almost, it couldn't draw a normal distribution really more perfect than, than that. The guy, the, you know, the males were a little bit off, but still pretty close to a normal distribution. So this was like a good example where it's a lot of times these biological markers are like human performance stuff. We see it follows a normal distribution. Uh, I also had this like huge powerlifting database, like all these different powerlifting meets. So I used one of the lifts, the deadlift, and I kind of mapped out the distribution for both male and female kind of amount, the, the amount of weight lifted. Pretty close to a normal distribution. It's a little bit right skewed. And I kind of had an idea about what the data looked like to know why that was probably the case. And I'll, I'll mention that in a second. But if we look at the averages, right, kind of Female weight lifted is about 300 kilograms. If I'm trying to think about where the average is, maybe like just over between five and 600 for, for men. So the mean, we kind of shift that distribution quite a bit to the right. We look at the numbers here. Um, it actually ends up being, you know, the height of this distribution. They're not on the same graph. So the Y axis is different, but notice the height here as high as it gets is 0 0.0035, but over here it's 0 0.00 almost seven. So once again, it's the same kind of thing. The male distribution was shifted to the right, but it has a much higher variance. There's a lot more variation we see in that data. Now, I started thinking, okay, so here you could use this data and be like, well, men are way stronger than women, right? Well, let's hold, the, hold, hold up on that. First of all, the reason why we maybe have slightly a right skew distribution to this, even though it's like a human performance measure, is there's like a lot of really heavy people kind of on this right hand side and the heavier you are, the easier it is to lift more weight. Right? So, you know, there's a lot of 300 pound, 300 plus pound men in the database. There wasn't near as many 300 plus pound women. So I use this thing that they, they calculate in powerlifting called a Wilkes. And it basically just takes the amount of weight that's lifted and essentially divides it by the person's body weight. So you're trying to get like a per pound measure or a per kilogram measure of strength. And if we use that instead to make our statements, notice now a little bit closer, especially the men's weight lifted, really, I mean, this is like a perfect normal distribution. I mean, this is you know, as, as, as good as it gets. But then if we look at the means, looks like it's just below 400 or somewhere between 350 and 400. Look at the mean for females, 
maybe a little bit lower, but still right you know, close to 350 and maybe a little bit higher. So once we look at something that takes into consideration this one other factor, which was the weight the person actually weighed, like their actual weight, we get a strength measure that looks like actually pretty similar between these two, right? Um, and in fact, you know, if we look at kind of the, the right tail here, we see a little bit thicker of a right tail for women than we do for men here, right? Um, so kind of interesting just thinking about, you know, are we looking at the right variable to make the statement that we're making? Um, just seeing how these normal distributions pop up in all these different biological markers. Um, just a little bit more proof of that and some things that I thought were kind of interesting. Okay. So that's all the slides that I have up there. So I'm going to be reposting some new slides for Friday. We're basically just going to keep going with these normal distribution examples. We'll get more practice using the table. Like I mentioned, it is up there. So if you want to print it out, start bringing it with you or kind of having it in front of you, that would be something I would highly suggest. Okay. Uh, I also will be posting an online quiz, quiz as soon as I get back to my office. That's due before we meet on Friday. Okay. All right. Any questions from me before I let you guys get out of here? All right. We'll enjoy the, uh, the beautiful weather and the rest of the day, and I will see you guys on Friday.